Dune is an epic science fiction tale set in a distant future centering on a young nobleman's journey on the desert planet Arrakis, which is the only source of the universe's most valuable substance. In today's journey throughout the cosmos of cinema, we dive deep into the heart of the deserts of Arrakis, exploring the science behind some of the most iconic elements of Denis Villeneuve's Dune universe. Our first stop, the colossal creatures that dominate these arid landscapes, the sandworms. These leviathans of the desert are not just a testament to Villeneuve's visionary direction, but also a gateway into understanding complex ecological and biological concepts. How could such massive beings exist? What real world science supports or challenges the existence of these behemoths? And what role do they play in the intricate ecosystem of Arrakis? We'll unravel the threads that weave together fiction and reality. So buckle up as we embark on a scientific odyssey into the heart of Doom's most mesmerizing mysteries. We're your hosts, Chris Howard, Josh Jacobs, and Eddie Fernandez. Let's start with the colossal creatures that dominate the deserts of Arrakis and see how they worm their way into our hearts. That's one big ass heart worm pill. In Dune, we see the Woos, or worms of unusual size, hashtag Princess Bride Love, dominate Arrakis. These gooey gargantuans inhabit huge portions of the planet and move super fast. But how do they move through the sand? Let's assume that earthworms are the likely cousins of the sandworms. Earthworms use their flexible bodies, which are divided into segments, to burrow their way through the soil. The worm's body is also known as a hydrostatic skeleton which means its flexible skeleton is filled with fluid. An earthworm can have anywhere between 135 and 150 segments, depending on its body size. Each segment of the worm's body contains muscles that work independently of every other segment. The internal walls separate the segments and are lined with circular and longitudinal muscles. These muscles create a soft barrier between segments, allowing the segments to be controlled independently. And inside each segment, there's fluid that holds the segment's shape. So when an earthworm moves, the circular and longitudinal muscles take turns contracting. Contracting those muscles makes the segments thinner and longer, allowing the worm to reach forward. The earthworm also relies on anchors called setae, which are short, stiff hairs that can hold onto the soil. The movement of the earthworm is wave-like as muscles take turns lengthening and shortening. Another adaptive trait to consider is one evolved by fringe toad and horned lizards. They live in sandy desert areas and these reptiles have developed the ability to utilize body oscillations to effectively liquefy the sand around them, which makes it easier for them to bury themselves and move over small distances. Liquefaction kind of sounds like what happens in the bathroom after I eat some tacos from Taco Bell. <laughs> I took a look at how liquefaction works and wow, do I feel bad for our California audience. Essentially, any time vibration is applied to loosely packed soils with high porosity, the sand or soil particles move past each other and more easily similar to the way water molecules do, which creates a kind of semi-liquid. So by adding vibration to the mix and effectively causing the desert sands of Arrakis to behave like a liquid, the worms are able to move more like an aquatic animal would using a segmented hydrostatic skeleton to do so. Now, before we go any further, Eddie and I were talking about something the other day that I feel like all like early 80s to mid 80s kids will recognize that when Scrooge McDuck would leap off the diving board into his giant vault of uh, gold, he would literally just dive in and melt into the gold and swim around perfectly. When in fact, if he did that in reality, he would literally break his neck. <laughs> And more importantly, Eddie, I would like you to sing the, the DuckTales theme song right now. I actually don't know it by heart, but I know that you do. Life is like a hurricane here in Duckburg. Okay, that's all you get. <laughs> you know, for all the world building Frank Herbert did with the Dune books, I'm surprised all this talk of thick, meaty, vibrating worms didn't lead to a discussion about adult toys of the Imperium. You know, all things considered, between hallucinogenic powders and the multi-century Bene Gesserit orgy that led to the Kwisatz Haderach, I'm surprised they didn't dive deeper on that subject myself. But circling back on those thick, meaty, vibrating worms, how did they get that big? Is it even possible for animals to get that large? And the answer is yes. And there are examples of it here on Earth. 
The sandworms could have evolved to their immense size through a process known as island gigantism. In one part of Botswana, African lions live in, in a condensed area where massive water buffalo thrive. Not a normal prey for lions due to the size. I mean, water buffalo are huge. Huge. These buffalo are also slow creatures, and thus the lions have a constant food source that over the years has turned them into specialized hunters. The lions also evolved webbed feet due to the constant flooding of the Okavango Delta, which also made them strong swimmers building muscles that other lions just don't have. In environments where resources are scarce, such as the deserts of Arrakis, animals might evolve to be larger to better compete for those resources. When the largest dinosaurs and insects were around, oxygen levels were much higher than they are now, and more oxygen is hypothesized to create more hospitable conditions in the womb or egg, leading to larger creatures. So if the oxygen content is much higher on Arrakis, then that is another possible reason why the worms are so huge. Now uh, let's talk about the suits used by the characters in Dune. Uh, the desert planet of Arrakis is known for its harsh environment, particularly its thin atmosphere with little to no water. To survive in such conditions, the inhabitants rely on these intricate suits. The steel suits, as they're called, are full body suits designed to help the body preserve as much moisture as possible. Considering our bodies are made up of mostly water, when the body sweats or you have to go pee pee, the suits will absorb this, filter out the impurities and turn it into drinkable water that the suit would capture in small pockets. It's like, peeing and sweating into a camelback water bladder that has a full filtration system on it and then drinking it anytime you're thirsty. I kind of need one of those when I go for my long runs. In fact, water reclamation and desalination are legitimate principles. And even back in 1972, Thomas Jefferson was conducting- nope, experiments. stop, stop. Right. Thomas Jefferson was not born in 1972. He wasn't- No, I'm, I'm, I'm with Chris on- I'm with Chris on this right. one. It was totally. What did I say? 1972. <laughs> it was 1972, and and TJ was hanging out in Philly. <laughs> That's 1970. I would love. By the way, I would love to see Thomas Jefferson living in 1972. He would oh. be. His mind would be blown. <laughs> Dude, you know, you know, he would have a natural, right? <laughs> and he'd be openly dating black women. Back in 1791, Thomas Jefferson was conducting experiments with it, but it was NASA who needed it the most on the International Space Station where water is not so easy to transport from Earth, and so they created a forward osmosis water reclamation. But because it's so complex and very large, NASA is nowhere near ready to turn this idea into suits, but the science behind it is legit. While much of it may seem like pure fiction, it's fascinating to see how these concepts are grounded in real life scientific principles. So stay tuned next time when we bring whatever cool and interesting new scientific movie to the table and discuss the science behind these movies. I'm thinking Ghostbusters, I'm thinking Aliens, I'm thinking Planet of the Apes. The Abyss. More to come, people. The Abyss, that'd be a great one. It's about to come out on 4K Blu-ray for the first time on Tuesday. I love that movie. <laughs>